right, so welcome to Designing for Family Caregivers. So today, uh, it's gonna be uh, Rajiv Mehta, who's from the Atlas of Family Caregiving, Colleen Wiggins, who's from Santa Barbara Foundation, Sangeeta Garawal, who's from Helpsy, and myself, who's from Emmy Walters Fluor. And we're gonna kind of not do in-depth instructions because we wanna first get a sense of your caregiving experiences. Um, and I think usually, you know, people just think about caring for somebody who's older and very ill as family caregiving. Um, but we would like you to think a little bit broader. So, I know you just ate, but um, <laughs> let's, once you hear who you are, go ahead and stand up and stay standing. So, how many of you are caring for a parent or a parent? So go ahead and stand up. How many of you are caring for a spouse or partner? How many are caring for a brother or sister? How about for a son, daughter, or grandchild? How about even any pets? Maybe a few people over, but um, so um, you know. In a similar spirit, if you if you care for somebody, you know, did you also need? Is anybody getting help? And we'll just do hands for this for their for themselves. Is anybody caring for you? Okay. So I mean, what we see is that uh, as as Ajahn spoke about this morning as well, that this is becoming a larger and larger challenge. I think this is actually mm -hmm. okay, there we go. A larger and larger challenge. Um, we're all caring for a number of different people. Right now, it's about one in five are caring for somebody and that's getting bigger every day. But the numbers really vary depending on how you collect the information. So we just wanted to start by giving a little bit of context to seeing who is in the room and I'm gonna hand it over to Raj to talk to you about the Atlas of Caregiving. <laughs> Hello everyone. Alright, see if you can get over to you. So we can't value what we don't see. We don't tend to improve what we can't value. What I want to talk about today is although we're all looking for solutions, first we have to see. If we imagine an iceberg representing caregiving, we tend to look at the tip, which is the, the professional health care industry. But the vast majority of care is really done by families. That's us caring for our own. And today, family caregivers are often overwhelmed, suffering emotionally, physically, financially, and yet we keep demanding they do more. And why is that? It's partly because it's hidden and therefore not valued. It's hard to find a major social issue as little studied. What we know comes mainly from analysis of a few surveys, and these tell us that uh, the number of American adults involved in caregiving ranges from 40 million to 100 million people. So it's a big number. But with estimates ranging that widely, it tells you how poorly we see. Even using the most conservative uh, figures today and doing some rough analysis on the economic cost of family caregiving, we're talking about close to $500 billion. That's in the same neighborhood as the cost of Medicare and Medicaid. And what is the cost of the absence of family caregivers from participation in society? What is the cost of people not being able to reach their children, to be little league coaches, to take on challenging work assignments? These have not been estimated. So in a big data world, family caregiving is oddly a data-free zone. We really have very little information on who is involved, what do they do, what is the impact, what is the actual lived experience of day-to-day -day family caregiving. The nonprofit I lead is hoping to change this. We're looking deeply into caregivers' lives so that we can help them, millions of them, do their work with less stress and get more assistance and support. We're leading the development of a new science of family caregiving, developing innovative means combining traditional ethnography and new technologies to look deeply into our lives. And we began with a pilot study sponsored by the Robert Johnson Foundation where we tested these methods in looking deeply at 14 families' lives. And we develop diagrams to make the invisible visible. These show the day, the day in the life of 30-year-old Faye, who's caring for a mother with Alzheimer's while she put her professional life on hold. 
This particular diagram is called a care map. It shows who is caring for whom in a particular kind of situation and what they do. Even though it's a seemingly simple map, it's often had a profound impact on the families involved. So we're working with AARP to teach care maps and communities across the country and very closely with Santa Barbara Foundation to, have, to see how do we make this a fundamental tool in their community. And over and over we have found that how the deeper self-awareness had led to action and has led to much a stronger self-advocacy. It's also led to much more peer-to-peer -peer conversation and sort of, sort of um, sparking community wisdom. We'll soon introduce a digital care map tool, which will be beautiful, but it'll also allow a lot more information. And we're expecting this to be used by fairly soon thousands of families, which will provide a rich new data set on real world care ecosystems. Another tool we're developing helping people see what a day looks like. And they find that their day is so much more fragmented than they imagined, and that caregiving and the rest of life are inseparable. It's important to remember that caregivers are already often so time constrained. So as we do research, as we develop new tools, it's key that we don't make things worse. So we have to design things well to both help individuals um, manage their lives better while also providing data for society. So Atlas is learning to see, and we're teaching families to see for themselves. One of the most important starting points is acknowledging how little we know, that there's so much to learn about family caregiving. Another is to break out of boxes, to not ignore uh, non-medical tasks, to not ignore non-elderly care recipients. We cannot allow ourselves to oversimplify things. Caregiving happens in the context of complex lives and priorities. And finally, we have to measure what matters, not what is easy. It is very hard work getting detailed data about family caregiving, but this is not a business opportunity, it's a national imperative, as I just said. So in closing, I want to urge all of you to fight for sight, to support exploration and self-discovery, to resist the allure of act now, think later. If we're truly going to help families, first we have to see. So thank you. Good. And I believe we're going to tell you much more about what they're doing in Santa Barbara. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Come on. Okay, great. Well, as Brett, you said, the first thing that we need to learn is how to see. And what I want to talk to you about today is how we gain that ability through the tool called the Care Map. So, so I'm a family caregiver. I care for my mom. My mom, my mom and I get along great, but it takes time to do care for oneself. And so um, caregivers often don't realize that they're, they're caregivers, and the care map is going to help us to see. So I want to show you a little bit about how I did my own care map and then talk about how we use this in our community. So um, first of all, let me just explain what the care map concept is. First, I have to answer basically three questions and then draw my care ecosystem. It looks like this. So first of all, who do you care for? Who else cares for them? And who cares for and supports you? Really simple. Then I take out my pencil, and at this point, it's a pencil, and I draw my care ecosystem. So here's what my care map looks like. Um, I draw my mom, who lives in her house, over here to the, uh, the left. And I draw all the others that are supporting her. I have brothers and sisters. She has a church group. There's friends. There's neighbors. We put all that on the care map. Then I draw myself, and I live away from my mom, and you can see I've got my little network of support over there as well. Um, then we add some arrows to show how often we're communicating with each other, and we draw some circles to show what the distance, the physical distance is from the parent situation. But now I get to see, so what do I notice on my care map? Carefully, I can see that I'm talking to my mom pretty regularly. That arrow right in the middle is pretty strong, and it goes kind of one way because it's usually me calling my mom. And um, and then you know, as I look at my own care system, I look down at the bottom and I see all my friends, right? And 
my friends, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not talking to my friends hardly at all. Sometimes I feel so overwhelmed that I can't even reach out for the help that's actually there. So now this care map helps me to see and take action on the things that I can do to help myself. So it is an incredibly self reflective tool to help us. So there are different care maps for as you showed you some. Here's another, another care map with a lot of support. This, this caring situation has family, friends, neighbors, the healthcare providers, of course, and even the dog. So sometimes we notice that there are other caregiving assets in the situation that we never thought of until we draw it and we actually see it. Here's another care map. This care map shows a minimal amount of support. It shows how challenging caregiving can be. But what happens is that those that are in the situation now get to acknowledge the reality of what their, their experience is. So whatever your care map looks like, you actually now have this visual. So I'm going to take it up a level and talk about how this is happening in Santa Barbara County. So as the foundation for Santa Barbara County, we're hoping to ignite a revolution around innovation and caregiving. And so we have held care map workshops throughout our communities. In, in these workshops, participants gather in small groups after they do their care map, and there's some point where they get to self-reflect and look at their care map and what it's telling them. In one of these areas in the city of Mongo, we had a number of caregivers talking, and the, throughout the room we heard, I am so alone, I am so alone, I am so alone. It was just heartbreaking to hear this going on. But what emerged out of that social isolation was a growing awareness that they were all caring and that they were caring in this, they were in this caring space together. So now what's happened? Well, the hospital and the social service providers in the community have come together and created new pathways to receive services and supports for these caregivers. They've created a public awareness campaign it's called Caring Together Love Hope. And guess what the tagline is? You are not alone. It's a direct mirroring back to the community of what we're hearing out there that is now actually taking it to a whole new level of, of support for the caregivers. Let me share another example with you. So Betty and Myra are part of our local Latinx healthcare network. They went to a care map and each did their own their, you know, their care did their own care map, um, and they saw different things. Betty realized that she was caring and doing a lot of caring. Myra noticed that she was caring and there were a lot of other people caring. Well, what were their responses? Well, in the one case, there was the response of, well, there's other people that aren't doing anything. Now, in Betty's case, she felt empowered to request the help that she needed. In Myra's case, she found that she could express appreciation and gratitude. So it brought together these folks. When we talk about cultural competency and learning to overcome these challenges, the care map finds a way around those social mores so that we become one kind of people looking at this, our same situations and it brings us together. So let me just, let's think about this on an individual basis. You've seen some of these examples, right? So you know, you see the people in the pictures and I shared with you my story. Imagine what this, this could do if we took it bigger. In Santa Barbara County, it's really taking hold, and it's helping us as a community to embrace this issue. But what if this grew and it became as big as California, or let's say the United States, or maybe the world? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this care, your care map and caring together brings us together as human beings in ways that we never envisioned before. Before. So, um, of course, there's more to just seeing your situation in caregiving, and supports are needed. But the care map gives us a place to start. And for caregivers like me, I'm looking forward to getting other supports, and Sakit is going to talk to us about what some of those are. I'm actually going to jump in line. I have Candy again. All right, so I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about some interactive tools for family caregivers. Um, we 
we design these multimedia programs and interactive phone calls that hospitals actually prescribe to patients and families. But as you can imagine, uh, there's not an easy default way to get something into the hands of a family caregiver. Um, and there's a lot of concerns that caregivers start off having that they know that they're worried about. They're scared to go home. They often don't know what they're doing. But there's also a lot of things that they don't know to be worried about. Um, and I experienced this firsthand. You heard about the social isolation. I've even had friends who lost their homes, lost their marriages, all as part of intense caregiving in their family. Um, so these are really big effects that are huge that people are not prepared for. For example, they have a lot of depression. People have a lot of sleep issues. They're more likely to drink, smoke, abuse drugs, get injured, have a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, there's the social isolation again. And there's actually good effects of family caregiving as well. People tend to feel a sense of efficacy. They develop a deeper relationship often with the person they're caring for. Uh, I even developed a deeper relationship with my brand new sister-in-law at the time because we were thrown into caregiving together for my dad. So there's interesting things that happen as well. Um, and one of the things that we also focused on is um, transitions from hospital to home. So that's where the family suddenly is like handed the patient, basically. And there's growing evidence that involving informal caregivers in discharge is really helping reduce things like readmission. So there's benefits for everybody all around. So just to give you a little more context on how this works, um, I was actually living through some of this at the time. My own dad was very sick. We were in and out of the ER for heart failure and for a number of, of different things. Um, but these are multimedia programs that are web-based that everybody in the family can watch at home. They can watch them multiple times. They can even share them with extended family. At one point, we were sharing them with neighbors so they would understand maybe not to bring like cookies over for my dad and different things like this. Um, but for something like dementia, it can really help the family understand how to cope with this for the first time. How do you deal with wandering? How, how do you respond when people don't remember things anymore? These are all really new and difficult, and it's often counterintuitive to know how to respond in the moment and not make the person who's starting to deal with dementia feel worse. Um, this is an example of a program we made just for family caregivers who are going home with somebody who's getting a left ventricular assist device. This will give you a, a sense for what the multimedia programs are like. So of course we spend a lot of time helping people understand what is the device, how do you keep the battery charged, how do you have backup batteries charged, all these things that people are very panicked about, but also about the, the social elements of the relationship and how this is going to change the person that they're living with. So I'll give you an example. And one more thing. It's important to think about how an LVAD may change your partner's identity. For example, some people are very athletic and may feel annoyed they can't take part in all the activities they used to. Some people are used to providing for their family. If they can't work after an LVAD, it's common to feel upset if they can't do that anymore. And sometimes people feel frustrated just trying to find clothes that make them feel attractive and still have room for the device. So it's important to keep in mind some of the limitations your partner might have now and the frustrations that might come along with that. So a different kind of element that I think is usually discussed with family members, um, and this came with a lot of input not just from clinicians, but from patients and family caregivers. Um, so then in terms of helping people go from hospital to home, we really try and pull these things together. So in the case of something like heart failure, we actually combine these programs and calls across 45 days. So when you're in the hospital and you're still at the bedside, you're actually signed up for this. You understand these calls are coming on behalf of the hospital, and they're going to help you stay on track and know what to do day to day. And I'm in the, I was in a medical family, and we were going through this, and I'm telling you, we really could have used this because there's so much chaos day to day, moment to moment. So, for example, on one day, you'll get a, a call about follow up appointments. And even if you live far away, hey, can you help your parent uh, get to make sure they have a ride to get to their follow up appointment? And then other days, animated videos that help them understand different issues. So for something like this, this is a quick example of what a call might sound like. For people with heart failure, 
it's very important for them to see their primary care doctor for a follow-up appointment that very first week back at home. Their doctor may not know they were in the hospital. And if your friend or family member was just told they have heart failure, their doctor may not know that either. But it's extremely important for their doctor to look over all their medications, especially since the hospital may have changed some of them. Okay, here's how you can be a huge help. Please call or check in on the patient to make sure they have a follow-up appointment set up to see their doctor in the next seven days. Also, make sure they have a way to get to that appointment. I know this seems simple, but making sure they get there is one of the best ways you can help them feel better and stay out of the hospital. So it really helps the family care coordinate, stay on task together, and even understand what's going on if there are distances between them. Um, we're helping everybody understand that they're being asked to do things like weigh themselves every day and why they're being asked to do those things, why they're being asked to do things like keep track of salt, which is very confusing for people. Everybody wants their favorite foods, wants their back home, um, and even how to help do that. So there's a lot of hidden salt. It's not just about taking that salt shaker off the table. So we're helping the whole family understand, oh, you don't want to accidentally give dad something that could make him much worse. Um, and we're helping them understand uh, what those weight changes mean. And we're actually collecting that information from the patient and reporting it back to the hospital every single day. Um, so that's reassuring to the family as well that the hospital is going to know to reach out to them if their parents suddenly gain like four pounds in a week. Um, so just to give you an example, over the last, uh, for, for one organization, just over the last year or so, we cared, called about 276 family caregivers through this type of system which comes to about 4,600 calls. So you can imagine that would be almost impossible to do with any kind of staff. And we're connecting a large portion of the time with those family caregivers and finding out what they need. And we're also checking in on the family caregivers. So we're collecting information mostly about the patient, but we're checking in to see if the family caregiver is depressed about every other week. And if they are, the hospital will actually call them and reach out to them and find out how they're doing. And sometimes that's kind of all they need. But even that can be a big boost to them just getting through their next day or week. So that's what we're hearing from families who are starting to use this, that it's really helping them uh, know what to do day to day um, and how to share this with their extended care team. And now I'm going to ask Andy to take it. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Um, I think everybody's talked uh, about, uh, we only talked about the invisibility of caregiving and how uh, we expect a lot from our caregivers, uh, but we haven't placed value on it. Um, and how, in a clinical setting, can we support our caregivers? And also, um, if you are a caregiver, what are the kind of things you might want to start asking? Um, your care team. So that's what I'm going to touch on more from a clinical perspective and tools. Like I said, it's a one sided relationship. We ask a lot. I'm an oncology nurse. Um, so when I'm working with, um, with the patient and the family, I have a lot of ask from the family, especially if my patient is going through a transplant. We will not do that unless there's a dedicated caregiver. So we have a lot of ask from the caregivers and family. We cannot be successful without them. But on the other side, how much are we able to help? And I think that's where this problem comes in. Um, so like I said, you know, we, we expect that, that somebody in the caregiving is there uh, to support the patient, to understand what is needed. Uh, we expect that the caregiver uh, can help with the medications, with all the activities of daily living. They will provide support to the patient. They will, of course, be working and be able to pay for the care and deal with all the insurance and many, many, many more things that are not even listed here. But on the other side, do we provide support to the caregivers? What do they want from us? They want that, first of all, above everything, that we acknowledge the role of a caregiver and that we couldn't be there for the patient without them. Listen to their voice, and then we, and then what they want from 
healthcare team is that we understand their responsibilities, their limitations, with that they need to go to work or um, they have certain things they need from us so we can provide that. Um, but a lot of times we just close our ears to like, no, we are here all to support the patient, not you. Um, <laughs> so we completely ignore the needs of caregivers, but at the same time, without them, we would not be able to care for our patients. They would not be able to even come to the hospital um, to get their treatment. So that got me really thinking about how I, as an oncology nurse, would be there for the caregivers. And it was a bit of a dilemma because the point that I was able to internalize is the need of caregivers. And Raj, you talked about the in invisibility. You talked about the care caregiving map. And I think I saw those things happening in the family dynamics, a lot of fights, a lot of issues, a lot of challenges, limitations, and suffering. At the same time, if I try to address all the needs, the part I struggle with is that I'm handling at least four patients at one time, and it's 2x my workload, it's, um, there is no time really to ask how are you doing or how can I help you because I don't want to open that can of worms because I don't have time to deal with it. Um, it's, not, um, it's not covered in the insurance time, so I cannot um, work on it and whatever, is, whatever I didn't chart, I didn't do, which means more than 50% of my time goes in charting. Um, so as much as I want, I cannot provide everything for my uh, for the family and caregivers. So I started to think about what are the ways then that we could support in little ways um, to support the caregiver and truly acknowledge their role. So to change this one-sided relationship to a two-sided relationship. I think the first thing is to change this from one-sided relationship to two-sided. So recognizing that the caregiver and the patient are the experts. They know what it is day to day to live in that role, what they need, and what is best for them. So listening to that and addressing that is most important. I think as from somebody from clinical capacity, all that we know is the pathology and the treatment, but we do not know life. And recognizing that is really, really key. And beyond that, I tend to think about practical little things that can be done. So I'm going to share with you what we built. But think of it as ideas and inspirations that you can use in your clinical setting or that you can ask your care team. So one is getting mirrored reminders. So if your loved one is needs some appointment, you can ask for mirrored reminders. So you get a reminder and a notification too that your family member needs to be there. And getting those reminders early on, so um, there are a lot of diagnostics and screenings which we know happen every six months, every year. Getting those notifications early on so you can plan who's going to take mom or dad there. Being able to coordinate. Um, so there are a lot of apps out there, uh, ours is just one of them, that allows everybody to get on the same platform and be able to figure out who's going to do what. Um, so you can share the load that like you talked about in the caregiving, uh, the atlas of caregiving. And what are the other options? So if you have to go to work and you cannot take your loved one, what are the other options? And there are a lot of times hospitals allow video visits, so you can use that. Or there are transportation resources. Uh, I know that when I was, um, when I worked as an oncology nurse, I never talked about these resources to my patients. But when I started building the platform, I realized there were over 10,000 resources available, uh, 10,000 organizations available for cancer alone, for all different types of categories. So finding and utilizing those to support you and including that in your atlas of caregiving. And getting access to the information if, uh, if there are other members in the family who are caring. So, getting the handouts, getting the videos, getting information so you all know what to expect 
and everybody is educated to treat uh, and to support uh, the loved one. A lot of times, you're not educated, so how are you going to help the family member, even though your intentions might be good? Um, so get that information shared with everybody. Um, getting reminders for anything that's important, like if there's an important chemo medication they're supposed to take once a week or every three days, ask them to send you reminders. A lot of places will have tools to do that. And then, as caregivers, we become sometimes patients too, or have little side effects and things. So, being able to take care of ourselves and look for remedies that will help to for self care. Uh, what we worked on is utilizing 20 plus evidence based modalities for all your um, all the common symptoms. And don't be afraid to ask for more help. Get a coach, get a yoga practitioner, physical therapist, psychotherapist whatever you need to feel better. See if your hospital can provide automated triaging, so if your, if your loved one's condition is getting worse, and like in the map you were showing, if your mom is getting worse, can they inform you that her condition has suddenly changed? And like I talked about the support groups, there's a lot out there, and if you feel like a patient, try to find things to take care of yourself, because you can only give when you have energy and feel supported. I hope we can change from a one-sided relationship to a two-sided relationship. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions, and we'll do our best to answer whatever we have. Did you have any questions? Oh, we couldn't have been that persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> Is there going to be anything in there around like dealing with insurance and like how do you get um, even like the resources that your family member needs? Anything in where? Um, or I guess what? How do you figure out like what resources your family member qualifies for and what to do if they don't? Like things like a bed, for example, that like moves up and down or something like that. Right, I mean, so the hospital helps with some of those things right now, but there are also some other tools for family caregivers. Um, for example, there's a place called Wealthy uh, that is providing people basically with kind of a geriatric care manager, where so even if you're here and your mom's in Florida, they can send somebody there who can kind of go in and see what she needs and help us, and is familiar with the local resources to help. Um, and I know Wellness is helping to compile those as, as well. Um, but there are services like that, and some of them are being provided directly to consumers or um, even through employers in some cases. Um, so right now, it's really challenging in terms of some of the work that we do to even know what insurance you know, your parent has and what they can get. So, but there are some places that that's a big piece of what they're focusing on is basically helping you get a care coordinator who can help with the local resources based on what your status is. Yeah, and I'll just make a comment to that. Um, there is the work that we're doing in our communities. We do have some of those social workers that help to connect. Um, we are looking at the services that will be provided, and we did notice that that particular service is one that needs to be looked at a little bit more. So thank you for asking the question. Um, yeah, and I think to to add to that, um, that, there are a lot of support groups and community resources that help to um, figure out what uh, is covered by insurance and help you walk through the process. So look at what are those community uh, organizations that can help. A lot of times there are even resources for things we might not even know exist, like uh, paying for medications or transportation, etc. I would just add that um, there's both today there's both a challenge of sort of untapped resources and that there are resources and most people just don't know about them. And but at the same time, being on the board of the Family Caregiver Alliance, which is a major nonprofit in San Francisco that provides uh, services to you know sort of information services in the Bay Area, if um, you know even more than one percent of the Bay Area population that could use this information reached out to us, we'd be overwhelmed and not be able to serve them. So there's both untapped resources and significantly 
too little resources so. Um, the care mapping, it was the picture of people sitting around the table together and that kind of an environment was really, I wanted, I wanted to know more about the stories. Can you just unpack a little bit the experience of working with groups of uh, people, caregivers sure. or, with that model and how, how that just feels to be doing it? Yes, yeah, so the question was about the photo of people sitting around sort of doing the care map together. Um, it came about really because a conversation that Felina and I was having about a year and a half ago. I was like, oh, why don't we try that? Um, and initially it was a little odd idea because honestly, it takes you five minutes to learn to draw this care map. It's, it's pretty trivial. Pencil, paper, stick figures. And yet we decided to sort of design a two hour experience where we're sort of teaching the tools slowly and allowing people the time to, in their own minds, unpeel the onion to look into their own lives more deeply. Um, and so that's part of the experience, but doing it in a group turned out to be really critical. The magic of the workshop is uh, the portion of it where people simply hold up their drawings to each other and take a minute or two to describe what they've drawn. It's really in telling their stories that their own learning happens. That's really key. The other thing that happened when people heard each other's stories is even though the situation may be dramatically different, they hear such commonality in the sense that, oh, other people are struggling with this too. Because caregivers today are so kind of socially isolated because they don't talk about their situations with others. And so they think that there's something that they're inherently incompetent at because things are so difficult. And discovering that everyone is struggling with issues somehow opens them up to the community. And a lot of these uh, ripple effects of people opening to each other have been because of that communal experience. Yeah. So I, what's really a turning around in my head is how can you take the, you know, what you're learning from the caregivers, how can you translate that into some positive policy changes? Because those resources that you all just spoke out about, um, gotta tell you, frankly, they don't exist. And the 99% of families in this country can't afford a geriatric. I couldn't when I needed one. So we have to figure out how to translate that wonderful work into concrete policy, healthcare delivery, and research change. Yeah, I think, um, so did everybody hear the question? So the, the thing is that what we're dealing with is a very complex problem that evolved into the shape over 200 years of sort of letting it evolve. It will not get solved overnight. And as you know, I sort of uh, the title of my talk was first we have to see. So what we're trying to do is helping people see much more clearly what the problem is, so that we as a group can start figuring out how to address this. And part of what's happening, I mean, sort of me being a very optimistic person, is that um, sort of unleashing community wisdom is more than a little slogan. We think since almost all care is happening at home by family members. Most of our ideas and solutions are going to come from each other. And so there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, Susanna Fox is here and she talks about peer-to-peer -peer help, which is a really you know, critical idea there as well. And we, again, me being optimistic, think that as we all get much more activated and aware of this, then, well, some people like you who think about policy will hopefully come up with good policy ideas, but then all of us will be much more supportive of it, knowing that all of us share these challenges that it's not that I'm an incompetent caregiver. And I think one of the things that we see too is um, that the hospitals become more aware of the family caregiver by using these tools. So they say, oh, this is what we're learning around family caregivers with heart failure. What are we missing over here? Because some of these places have gone back and made huge changes. In fact, one of the things they can see is floor by floor what's happening with discharge based on how we report this information back to them. And they're like, why is this floor not having readmiss, but this floor is having a ton of readmiss? And they go in and they're able to start to see what are the differences that are happening and put new policies and procedures in place, even just within those hospitals. So I think it's slower than everybody wants it to be, but I also think that uh, to your point, I can't go out and afford a director care manager either. But I think it is interesting that um, employers are starting to look at some of these things and how they can help make these part of benefits for people to at least help offset the cost or share the cost or something like that. Yeah. 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 Y
I just want to make one comment to the public policy piece, and that is that, you know, in putting some of these pieces together, we are gathering new data. As, as Raj, you've talked about, they're really, this is a pretty data-free zone. And so gathering that data that can then communicate in a larger context is really crucial. And that's what we're working on right now. It's a work in progress, admittedly, but the preliminary results are just pretty staggering with our hospitals. And again, most care is out of the acute care setting, but even there, what was baked into the Affordable Care Act around readmissions um, or reducing readmissions or the penalties, I should say, on hospitals for readmissions, um, we're seeing really incredible results by supporting the caregiver outside of the, in the post-acute care setting in reducing their readmission rates. So, um, but it's very preliminary, so I'm not really at liberty to contact for comment for you. Also, I think in a, when we start to raise awareness, we start to build a community and a world around it, that there is caregiving community like the way I think Alzheimer's and other communities have done phenomenal work in advocating for themselves. As we start to make caregiving as not just an isolated thing, but a community, we start to come together with the data we are now able to bolster our claim. And with the way the healthcare policy, which I know a lot of things are up in the air, uh, but there's a lot of uh, leverage, I think, not just at national level, but at regional and state level, because the care and the policies are now being uh, being trickled down, activated as patients, as we educate the clinical team more about the value of caregivers and they understand it, together we are able to go and make changes uh, at state and national level. Uh, and I truly believe in the power of that. I've seen that happen last year uh, with the 21st Century Act. Uh, we went and advocated on Capitol Hill, and before the end of the year, uh, that act did get passed. 